Um, just first thing, just a little bit of shameless advertising. Um, I've been thinking about how we ought to think about probability in physics, including systems mechanics, for a while now, and have been working on a book which has some of the history of the discussions of the um, of, of these things. And about two months ago, I sent it off to publishers to um, see if anyone wanted to publish it. But in the meantime, if you want to take a look at whatever the current draft is, it will always be in that folder. There have been some minor changes. Um, since I sent it to publishers, but um, but but you know, it's basic form. And if you have any comments, like if there are passages that um, seem unclear to you, um, please um, email me and, and ask me about it. If you find trivial typos, don't worry about it. I haven't gone through. At some point, I'm going to go through it, do a very thorough proofreading, and probably hire a proofreader. So don't don't you know don't tell me things like you you know I misspelled a word here or there, but. Yeah, if there are things around, if there's, you know, substantive things. Okay, so um, Kevin and Shelley and I didn't really confer about the contents of our um, talks before um, doing this, but um, in, in, you know, it's, it's turned out that um, when the schedule was put together, it was done really well to have those guys in, fr in front of me because um, with any luck, if you're, if you're new to all this stuff, you're probably wondering, why the hell would anyone take Gibbs entropy seriously in the first place? Why would any smart people even be paying attention to this quantity? And um, essentially what you can say about um, Gibbs entropy, you can also say about von Neumann entropy, because von Neumann entropy um, is very much the quantum and mechanical analog of the um, um, Gibbs entropy. And um, the answer is, you know, I mean, it could be. You know, one, thing, one hypothesis we, can, we, we should always consider is there's just, just a lot of bullshit that gets repeated in the textbooks and, uh, uh, and people are, you don't really understand what they're repeating things that they got taught that they didn't really understand. And I think there actually is a, quite a bit of that in the statistical mechanics textbooks. Um, however, um, there is something that Shelley mentioned um, in passing at the end. There, is, there are interesting connections between Gibbs entropy and the thermodynamic formalism. And those tend not to be very well explained in the textbooks. And so what I wanted, so my purpose of my talk here is purely pedagogical. Here's what I think everybody should know. Here's what I think should be clearly explained in the, in the, in the textbooks about the relation, why anyone would think that it, Gibbs entropy would have anything to do with any thermodynamic quantities um, at, at all. Um, so um, as I said, um, this is purely pedagogical. So please, especially the grad students, feel free to interrupt. Um, I am going to be going some, over some material that will be new to, um, I'm sorry, will be familiar to some people, but presumably everything I'm going to say is, is going to be useful to you know, at least one person at the end. So if I'm going, I will go over some basic stuff for those of you to whom this is the ba that's familiar. There's great snacks, or, <laughs> or but yeah, just but just bear bear with me. And um, if I say anything that you don't understand, please, grad students, um, interrupt. In fact, um, most of what I'm going to say is not actually going to be on my slides, except cases where I want exact quotes from people, because um, I find there's something sort of psychological effect that if you're doing if you're doing a presentation with everything you want to say in the slides, it seems more formal, and I want this to feel more like a classroom kind of situation. Okay, so nothing I'm going to say is new. Um, I'm going to be exploiting stuff that's in, in this book, um, which actually is worth reading. I think there's a lot of really um, good, insightful um, s um, stuff in there. Um, much of the same material is also in a nice f a, a, a pair of papers by Einstein. Um, these aren't among Einstein's most famous papers, um, they, um, they could be regarded as minor papers by Einstein's standards. Um, and certainly, um, they were certainly eclipsed by um, the um, papers he published in the Annus Mirabilis in 1905. But one of the really impressive papers in 1905, the one on Brownian motion, 
Um, basically is using stuff that he, he developed in these, in these papers. He was thinking about how to deal with fluctuation phenomena in statistical mechanics. And um, um, he basically worked out on his own independently of Gibbs a lot of the same stuff that Gibbs did. And uh, 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 so was, I think those are worthy what you're, I'm reading too. Um, part of it's coming from a paper by Leo Tzillard, which is actually part of his doctoral dissertation. Um, some of it um, is in, um, in um, Tol Tolman's book, which I think is actually a pretty good textbook. Um, um, there, 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 there are things that one might not like about it, but I also think there are things to like about it. Um, von Neumann is the person who um, um, introduced von Neumann entropy in his classic book, The um, um, Mathematical Foundations of Quantum Mechanics. And I'm not going to talk about his argument for th thinking of this as the quantum mechanical equivalent of thermodynamic entropy. Because Tim asked us not to say, talk about things we don't understand. And, I, I, and maybe if I sit down really seriously and try to figure out what's going in that, it, it, on in that argument, I'll have a better sense of, of what, it's, what he's doing there. But at the moment, I don't have a really good sense. But, OK. Um, and most of the um, theorems I'm going to be evoking are actually fairly trivial mathematically, but I think they're of some interest um, nonetheless. OK, and I have a request. Oh, actually, so I said, uh, yeah, this, uh, this, this stuff what I'm talking about, I don't know of good textbook presentation of it. Um, so there's bits and pieces from, from, from these people. Um, um, my presentation is influenced by the way Owen Maroney puts it together in a paper um, that he put on the archive and then never, um, never um, submitted it to a journal. Um, but so yeah, that's. Um, available on the archive if you're um, interested. Before I start request, on the previous slide, and I, I, I had Gibbs as one of the references. Um, I, I said I'm going to be drawing from a material developed by Gibbs. Um, And I swear I made this slide before I came here. So yeah, some, some of you may have heard things of the form, Gideon Statmec is committed to blank, and then the blank is filled by, by something implausible or absurd. Um, and um, the sort of things that Kevin was saying, yeah, as I said, those are not idiosyncratic. They're, they're, they're totally standard in the literature. So just because I'm drawing from Gibbs, don't assume that I'm, uh, that, I'm committed to any of those absurd things that you've been told are Gibbsian. If I do say something absurd or something that sounds absurd to you, then, then tell me. But don't you know, import you know, things that um, I haven't said. And if you want to know whether Gibbs said any of those things, there's a cheap Dover paperback. It's, you know, it's also on the Internet Ar Archive, so you can actually get Gibbs' book for free in PDF of it. So. All right. So what I want to do, because I want to talk about um, relations, be, uh, what, why Gibbs and um, um, von Neumann and Tolman identified certain quantities as, in some sense, an analogous to thermodynamic quantities. Let me just talk a bit about what thermodynamics. We had a really good introduction. Um, um, from Tim and from um, Franio yesterday, but I just want to have these things front in your mind. And first, one of the things that, that Tim said, I think bears repeating, um, if you're misled by the word thermodynamics into thinking it's like classical dynamics in that you've got a, a theory about how systems evolve in time, then you're just not understanding what the word means. Um, it was Kelvin who coined the word, and in context, it's absolutely clear what he intended to mean. Um, he wrote a long six-part paper or series of papers with a joint title on the dynamical theory of heat, which were um, published in, I believe, the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, 
And um, in the first one, he enunciates what he calls two fundamental principles in the theory of the mode of power and heat. And the first one is, a, is the uh, for, first law of thermodynamics. The second one is um, pretty much the, 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 the second law of, of, of thermodynamics. And then, you know, five or so iterations are, um, go by and um, a number of years go by, he's publishing bits of this thing sequentially. So in the, in the last bit, he re 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 recapitulates these and what had been a few years earlier, fundamental principles in the theory of the mode of power of heat are now fundamental principles of general thermodynamics. Context, it's absolutely clear that, that this newly in, in, introduced term is meant to be synonymous with that. It's the theory of the motive power of heat. And of course, that phrase, the motive power of heat, he gets from Sadi Kano. Right. So yeah, the fundamental distinction, the, the, the fundamental insight of thermodynamics, um, which um, uh, it was Gule's work that convinced Kelvin of this, is that heat and work are interconvertible. You can measure heat in the same, in, in this, in work in the same units. Um, the um, amount of work it takes to heat, say, a, a, a sample of water one, 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 um, one, one, one degree um, is um, the same, um, no, ma you know, no matter how, no ma matter how you do it. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so fundamental to the, um, uh, for thermodynamics is distinction of, of the two ways in which energy can be transferred from one system to a, another. There can be heat flow or you, know, you can, or you can do work, which paradigm example is lifting, is lifting a weight. Of course, what people were really interested in doing was exploiting temperature differences in heat engines to do things like turn a flywheel against a load, so that, sort of, that, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so um, basically the, f the first law of thermodynamics is essentially um, conservation of energy. Franio had this, that if I have, consider the internal energy of a body and something happens to it, there's some process that, um, that changes its internal energy, you, um, uh, um, Add up all the ins and outs in terms of work, and the ins and outs in, term, in, in, in um, ter terms of heat um, and together they're the change in total energy. And just a reminder, what these bars across the Ds are, are just to remind you that this is a change in a property of the system. The intern it, it makes sense to look at the system and say, what's its internal energy? Um, these are distinguished only as modes of energy tra transfer. It makes no sense to talk about the heat content of, the bo of a body or the work content of, of, of a body because um, you can put energy in a body as heat and get it out as work and vice, and, and, um, vice versa. Okay. All right. The second law, um, one for formulation of the second law um, was Carnot's principle that heat does not um, spontaneously pass from a colder bo body to a warmer body. And um, not, um, that's taken in the sense that not only does it not spontaneously pass, is that there's, there's nothing you can do that you, know, you can't take, there's no engine you could have that operates in a, in a cycle where the engine, re, between two heat baths, the engine returns to its original state and the only cha overall change was heat going from the, the, the cold, colder body to the hot body. And um, um, Clausius, um, uh, the the hist history of this is that um, Kelvin realized that, uh, well, Clausius realized that um, the consequence of all this is all reversible engines, engines that could be worked um, uh, um, at the same efficiency in both ways, um, had to have the same efficiency, 
because um, if there was, you had a reversible engine that's something more efficient to it, you could just um, take the more efficient um, one to, deri to drive the other one backwards as a, re as a refrigerator. Um, so, um, um, all, he you know, all, all heat reversible heat engines have the same efficiency, and Kelvin um, realized that you could um, use that to um, define a universal temperature scale, something that's you know, not dependent on any particular um, uh, um, type of thermometer. Because actually back in those days, there's all kinds of different thermometers kicking around using different working substances and there were charts on how to convert from one scale to another and there are places where we have temperature records but we don't know what they mean because we don't um, know how to translate between that temperature scale and Celsius. Um, but anyway, so there's this thermodynamic, natural thermodynamic um, um, uh, um, um, temperature scale and so if I've got a hot heat bath and a colder heat bath um, and I'm running a, um, a machine between them so I take a certain amount of cute um, um, heat in from the hot bath, do some work, take a, a, a put a number of certain amount of heat um, out, this ratio for you know, the, the maximum efficiency, which is efficiency of uh, um, a, um, um, a universal machine, is um, a function only of the temperatures of the two heat baths. So you can just define the, 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 um, the temperatures, a temperature scale in terms of those ratios. And if you do that, then, um, Taking Q1 um, as positive going into our engine and heat going out of the engine is as negative. So Q1 is a positive quantity, Q2 is a negative quantity um, in a cycle um, that um, uh, um, has, it has to be zero. And that's for a perfect engine, a reversible engine. And um, for a less than perfect engine, you're actually discarding more heat than you needed to. So this Q2 is bigger than it needs to be and Q2 is negative. So for a less than perfect engine, that, that, that's, that's, that's negative. Um, so, um, but for, for a um, perfect engine, or if you don't think perfect engines um, can actually exist. You can imagine a sequence of engines that more and more closely approximate it, and then you get this bound, right? So this is what they really mean when people talk about the fiction of a reversible engine, is that there is a bound that can be gotten to you know, um, arbitrarily clo um, cl closely. Um, um, so that, that means that for any reverse, if you have any system whatsoever, any Reversible processes takes you from one thermodynamic state. You do various things and exchange heat um, with various heat baths around, um, you know, around any reversible cycle. Um, if you've got or this is often expressed um, in a different in, in a um, in a differential form where you're imagining that um, it'd be composed of lots of little heat, heat exchanges, possibly at different temperatures so you can actually um, in, um, integrate it and if this is true you know, so I've got two states here and if there's a process that takes me, okay, A and B, that takes me from here to here, and another process that takes from me here to here in, um, um, that's, that, that satisfies this, then the same has to be true for any way I get from A to B. So this, the, uh, the, um, 
the, um, this quantity here is going to be independent of which reversible process I use to go from A to B. And this is a quantity that um, in, um, I'm trying to remember the dates, um, um, 1853 um, Clausius uh, you know, um, uh, um, did, did all this and um, he called this quantity the equivalence value of, a, of, of the Q, Q over T, the equivalence value of the heat um, because it, it um, gave you some kind of sense uh, of, uh, or I mean, sorry, the, um, the difference between two, two states that um, is that quantity over a reversible process, the equivalence value of, of, the, of the heat. And um, then he later decided this is an important quantity. And really important quantities should be have names derived from dead languages so that everybody, be so that everybody can use the same name. Because obviously, uh, yeah, actually, um, he didn't call it equivalence value. I just translated that to English. It was equivalence wert or whatever the German is, right? But then everyone's going to use the same name. No one's going to all use a German name unless it's a Stolzsal Um So if, if you, if, if it's, um, so, um, so he says, let's call this entropy um, from the Greek word for transformation in, with analogy to uh, um, en energy. Okay, so I'm just saying this, fix this in your mind. Um, if we're going to want to have some kind of statistical mechanical analog of entropy, what we're going to have to do is say, well, how does this all look from a statistical mechanical point of view? How are we going to distinguish between um, energy exchanges, exchanges as heat and energy exchanges as work? And can we find a, pro, a, 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 a statistical mechanical analog, something that is going to satisfy this? Right, so that's what, that, you know, that, that's what we want. That's what, that's what, we're, that's what we're looking for. Um, so, um, but, or maybe not exactly that because Interestingly enough, the same people who were um, developing the science of thermodynamics, um, Clausius and Kel Kelvin um, and Rankine in the er early days, were also interested in this new speculation, well, it was about 100 years old, but it was be becoming more popular, the kinetic theory heat, the idea that gases are indeed made of lots of molecules uh, um, 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 bouncing around and that what we think of as heat is really just a, a, a sort of motion. And um, if you think about it, that means if you try to, you know, um, if you think about it, the air in this room, in terms of its macroscopic properties, it's more or less uni uniform pressure and temperature. But if you were, you know, to squint and look at that at a very fine, deep, you know, at a re region that's too small, um, in a tiny region, number of molecules in a small region isn't going to be constant. The amount of kinetic energy found in a given time in a, sort of in any region is going to be constant. On the microscopic level, things are changing all the time in a situation that we think of as thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is a situation on the kinetic theory. Thermal equilibrium is a situation where at the macroscopic level, everything looks peaceful and calm, but at the micro level, there's, all, there's, all, there's furious activity. Right. And um, it also means that um, the laws of heat transfer are sort of parasitic on the laws of mechanics, because, um, which wasn't obvious to people. When people thought that heat was a, um, a, um, a, a, a separate, a simple substance called caloric that flo flowed from place to place. It's not clear that, cl that uh, um, the usual laws of classical mechanics applies to it or, or, or not. But it, it's, 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 this, is, this is a dynamic theory of heat. It's also called the mechanical theory of heat, right? And um, um, what people realized then is that well, if there's all these uh, um, fluctuations going, uh, happening around, you know, occasionally the, uh, um, 
energy will, if you have two things in thermal contact, energy will more or less spontaneously flow to, to, from one to another. In tiny amounts, it might be too small to notice, but it's happening. So we're not going to be able to get a strict derivation of the, uh, the second law from, um, from, 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 from mechanics is going. Uh, um, and also, um, and we've heard part of the story already, um, there's the reversibility argument that um, anything that's going to be a theorem of classical dynamics on the assumption that you've got uh, the interparticle forces are dependent only on the distances between them, um, you're not going to get a temporally asymmetric um, inclusion from the dynamics alone. Any process that goes one way, change all the velocities um, uh, um, um, that go the other way. So Maxwell, starting around 1867, letters to friends was saying, second law of thermodynamics actually can't be strictly true. Um, and so it, he, he wrote a letter um, in December to his good friend, Peter Guthrie Tate, and who was writing a book um, on, on thermodynamics and, and wanted advice from Maxwell. He said, well, I suggest you pick a hole in the second law of thermodynamics. And then Maxwell proceeds to um, give an exposition of what we now call Maxwell's demon. Um, but the re I'm not going to talk about that at all. I'm gonna say, not going to say anything at all about Maxwell's demon. What I'm interested in is that on that letter, someone wrote in pencil, very good. Another way is to reverse the motion of every particle in the universe and to preside over the unstable motion that's produced. Um, the reason I said someone is that when that letter was first published in um, the life and scientific work uh, uh, of, of Peter Guthrie Tate, um, the edit editor attributed it to, to, to Kelvin. Um, more recent um, scholars have, ha in a more recent collection of Maxwell's writings, the editors say, I think the handwriting looks more like, like Tate. So that's as far as I know the first time the reversibility argument was ever written down either by, um, by um, Kelvin or by Tate, we're not sure. Um, Maxwell then um, explains the argument to several friends. This is, this is great. Um, I, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on the, on the history, but I, I want to quote this article because I like it. I got the way through. Dear Strutt, and then, no, how are you? How are the kids or something like that? No, just, dear Strutt, if this world is a purely dynamical system and if you accurately resource the motion of every particle of it at the same instant, then all things will happen backwards at the beginning of things. The raindrops will collect themselves from the ground and fly up to the clouds, et cetera, et cetera. And men will see their friends passing from the grave to the cradle until we ourselves become the reverse of born, whatever that is. <laughs> I should probably be reading this in a Scottish accent. Imagine this being read in a Scottish accent. I'm not going to be trying to do that, because this is Maxwell talking. We should then speak of the impossibility of knowing about the past except by analogy is taking the future, but I do not think it requires such a feat to upset the second law of thermodynamics. He then proceeds to tell um, Rayleigh about the demon, and he then, after that, he draws, moral, the second law of thermodynamics has the same degree of truth as the statement that if you threw a tumbler full of water into the sea, you cannot get the same tumbler full of water out again, which I like. Um, because, um, okay, we all know that, right? You, you, you know, if I, you know, if I throw a tumbler full of, I take my water bottle, throw a liter of fresh water into the sea, and then scoop up, I'm not going to get a liter of fresh water. Now, what's, what's the force of that not? Is it impossible? It's not forbidden by the underlying laws of dynamics. But as Tim put it this way, you can bet your life savings that you are not going to get it, right? You, know, you can be as sure as you can be of, uh, sure of anything in this life that, you, that you're not going to get it. So there's this modality, um, it's not going to be dynamically impossibility, but, um, well, the, the, the um, way Maxwell put it, we, you know, it's, um, it's a statistical regularity. And at the time, people were very, the, the, the science of statistics was being born and people were collecting all kinds of data about births and deaths and things like that. And people were really struck by the fact that if you take a large enough population, 
and kind of cor and, and, and course grade the events. So not, you know, don't, don't ask whether this person died or, or something like that, but say, you know, how many people in a given um, age, age range died within a given year? You get very, very stable frequencies year after year. Those are statistical regularities. Um, and um, so they're the aggregate effect via things like the laws of large numbers of a lot of individually uh, um, random seeming or unpredictable events. Um, and when I say random seeming, there's no, you know, none of this is incompatible with de uh, um, um, de um, determinism. There can be effective randomness even in a deterministic um, system. And um, Gibbs also, working on thermodynamics, was thinking about the mixings of gases. I think we're gonna have a talk later on about um, uh, um, mixing of gases and so on. And you know, take, you know, take two gases initially in different parts of a, um, you know, so, so, you know part, con container separated by a part partition, pull it, pull it out, they're going to enter diffuse. Um, what, um, if, they're, if they're different gases, there's an increase of entropy there. Um, and Gibbs is saying, well, could they go back to the original situation? And he said, could they spontaneously unmix? And he says, well, if you think about this in terms of molecules bouncing around, it's not impossible. But if it's a large system, and if, it, and, and, you know, if it's one molecule bouncing around, and Tim's right, you wouldn't call that a gas. Um, um, if it was one molecule bouncing around, then yeah, it can end up, or two molecules bouncing around, they could end up back in the chambers they started with, no problem. But if it's a large number, and if you're expe expecting a macroscopically appreciable difference in the concentrations of gases in those two things, you can bet your life that it's not going to happen. So, and then um, Boltzmann also, um, in response to um, Loeschmidt, bringing these um, reversibility considerations, and Loeschmidt, um, in 1874, um, Kelvin published a paper where, 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 where that had these reversibility considera considerations in them, and Goldschmidt was aware of that. So he brings these, this um, consideration of Boltzmann, and Boltzmann's response you've already seen, it's got probability talk into it. So this motivates the idea that if we're going to get a statistical mechanical analog of the laws of thermodynamics, that we're not going to get a theorem that says this must happen, but it strongly suggests that it makes sense to bring probabilistic concepts into, into, into the theory. Um, another thing that motivates, um, that a little bit later motivated the idea that we want probabilistic concepts is um, analysis was by Einstein and, um, wait, that's not the, that's not the, the right, that's not what I want, no. I want this. Okay, what's happening here is, this is the one I want. Yeah, so, um, you know, um, Einstein and Schmolikowski um, analyzed, um, in, in, in statistical mechanics term, the phenomenon of Brownian motion. And here's a case where the sorts of fluctuations in concentration that I was talking about actually end up having a visible effect. You need a, you, you, you need a microscope, but um, you know, um, this is, you know, it, it's interesting, it's a good question to, what, what to call it because um, um, if you, um, so, okay, I'm not going to try and restart it. Actually, let me, let me just, let me just leave, it, leave, it, leave, going, leave, leave it going when I talk about it. Yeah, so this sort of phenomenon, so if it persists, if you let the thing, if you let the thing just sit there. You know, it, it, you know uh, um, people wondered, well, maybe are there little eddies in the fluid that we, w that we um, created when we put it down on the table. But if you let the thing sit by itself, these things continue to bounce around like this. And also, 
if you poke it in some way, so like if you swirl the liquid or something like that, you'll get currents and things that, because of friction in the liquid, dis di dissipate, and it settles down in, again into something like this. Now, do we call that equilibration or not? It's not a situation in which uh, of, of, classical, uh, of classic the thermodynamic equilibrium where all the observable parameters are are um, all, you know, all, all the observable parameters are constant. Things like the velocity and position of these Brownian particles are, are, are constantly changing. Um, but it is a sort of state that things tend to settle in where the state here is not a macro state but a stable pattern of fluctuations. I don't know. What, what, do we call that equilibrium or not? It's only a terminological thing. If I insist that equilibrium, be, you know, if I, if I count the positions of, and velocities of those Brownian particles as macro variables on the grounds that they're observable and they're ones we care about, then we would say that that particular system doesn't have a equilibrium macro space that do dominates it. it, 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 it it's it's um, constantly cycling through a bunch of um, different, different macro states. Or we could be interested in this phenomenon of settling down to this stable pattern of fluctuations um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, and um, getting information, as Einstein and Schmolkowski were doing, getting information about the um, medium that these things are suspended from by observing the, 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 these, these fluctuations. Because the analysis, what you do is um, basically you treat um, the particles as being in thermal equilibrium with the medium and what thermal equilibrium means in this context is a canonical distribution and that's basically how the the um, the the uh, analysis goes so in there if we're going to make a prediction if someone says well if i follow a particle how far is it going to give it go in in one second or two seconds or something like that well, Einstein and Schmolkowski says, well, here's a probability distribution for the displacement. I'm not going to tell you exactly what that particle is going to do, but here's a probability distribution, this probability um, for, for this displacement, this probability, and actually um, derived a um, expression for the expression, uh, the um, expectation value, the square, the displacement in terms of properties of, of, of the fluid and paren, use that to, um, observations of that to, um, to um, um, estimate Avogadro number. Okay. How do you do observations of an expectation value? Well, you do, you know, look, lots of observations and, and you average them. And if you, you do enough so that the law of large numbers um, tells you that the um, average of your observation should be close to the expectation value of, of yielded from that probability distribution. Okay, so um, close all. what's that? Close, close all. Okay, close all. That's what I want to do. Yes, thank you. All right, so this was just sort of motivating the these two things are just sort of consider motivation. The idea that what we want to talk about is probability distributions on the state space of, of, of the system. Also, um, um, actually, I, I, let me just, just um, leave it at that. Now, um, Gibbs and Einstein independently decided that, uh, that if we're going to talk about probability distributions um, on phase, the classical phase space, a useful tool is something that they bore, both borrowed from Boltzmann, which is the notion of an en en ensemble. Um, and probably the reason for that is frequentism about probability was very much in the air. If you, um, it's still, still very much in the air. I think if you ask, uh, if, if you ask um, physicists what probability means, very often they'll say, well, probability is long run relative frequency in a hypothetical sequence of things. Um, I think that's bullshit, um, and um, I've got a section of my book explaining why I'm not going to talk about that. So um, my own view is that this talk of ensembles in Gibbs and in, in, in Boltzmann and Gibbs and in Einstein uh, 
should be just pick, regarded as a way of picturing to yourself a probability distribution and nothing more. And, what we're, and Nina was saying uh, something similar to that. And we do actually want to um, be able, people sometimes say, well, probability is a concept I can't apply to individual systems. Um, and we do actually want to be able to apply it to individual systems. Um, you know, um, if you have, I've asked Tim if, whether he's going to bet his life savings at 10 to 1 odds on, on whether he's going to get that liter of fresh water out of the sea. He's, he, and, I, and I say, this is a one-time deal. It's still going to be a, bit, a good bet. He doesn't say, no, we have to do this lots and lots of times. Right? Right. So what I'm going to do now is talk about evolution of probability distributions over classical phase space and over quantum states with the presupposition that I, know, that I know what it means to talk about probability of an event applied to individual systems and sort of set aside to, to the later discussion what, that, what, you know, what that means. Um, one candidate is that there's subjective probabilities and whatever it is actually it should be something that, that informs our expectations. Like if uh, whatever this probability is, um, Tim um, should himself, you know, if, if he understands the analysis, should himself um, take it as highly unlikely that this is going to happen. It should, it should um, affect his betting uh, um, odds and his beliefs and stuff like that. And um, whether that's derived from something more fundamental or, or, not, or not. And actually, um, we make this remark and then set it aside. If you think well, that thermodynamics is fundamentally about the ability of beings like us who have only um, access to macro variables to extract energy from, 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 a, from a system, then there actually is a um, potentially interesting and sensible subject, which is a subject of give me some manipulations you can do, you, you can do um, um, what, um, give me some macro variables you care about, like the height of this, um, uh, 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 the, the height of this um, weight or the um, speed of this flywheel. And there'd be a well-defined, um, uh, um, potentially well-defined well um, theory of how an agent could use information about a system to do, to, to, to do work. It's not going to be fundamental physics, but um, I think that Maxwell, et cetera, um, thought that thermodynamics wasn't fundamental physics anyways. That it, it actually, its scope was limited to the um, situations in which you've got beings like us who are interested in certain kinds of things. As Tim emphasized, energy doesn't go away. Energy is conserved. But if I take a box of gases whose sides are initially at different temperatures and let it equilibrate so at the same temperature, all the energy is still there, but it is um, now in a form that's completely useless to me for doing anything like lighting the room or running a, 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 a bike or anything like that. Okay. All right, so, um, all right, so now something that everybody should have under their belt, and some of you already do, but I think uh, um, um, some of the, 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 the students in the room aren't really familiar with, with everything about what to say. Okay, suppose I've got a some and I speak very generically right now. You know, some physical system has got some kind of state space, which I'm going to call gamma, and I've got some kind of dynamics on the state space, which means that it's just a map. You know, for every t, there's a map from gamma to itself, which 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 tells you how one point in the state space goes under that dynamics to another, to a, to another point in the state space. So think, so far, so far you could be thinking about classical mechanics 
you could be thinking about quantum mechanics where the, the um, state space would be a set of vectors in, in, in Hilbert space. You know. okay. So if I have a probability distribution on that state space and just our terminology, because I think it, it, things got a little confused. Um, a probability function or a probability distribution is a mapping from, from subsets that assigns real numbers to subsets, appropriately to, appropriate subsets of the, of the state space. So what I'm really doing is I'm assuming I have a state space and I've got some set of subsets of the state of the state space, which are the ones that I'm going to assign probability to. Um, the you know, those are the measurable sets in classical mechanics. Um, uh, um, and uh, so I'm, and I, I'm, I'm going to assume that um, this set of measurable sets is closed under um, under union, under um, um, complementation, and actually under countable union. So if I have a countable set of sets that are all measurable, then the union of all of those is. Term for that is a sigma algebra. Familiar term to some, not to everyone? Okay. Yeah, so it's, um, it's a mapping from not necessarily assigning a probability to every subset of the state space, but you pick a sigma algebra that contains all the sets that you're going to be interested in. And thank you. Um, so, you know, probability function is a mapping from the signs, you know, real numbers to measurable, me 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 measurable sets. And um, if I've got one probability dis distribution, it could happen, so I've got you know, one, call it P. Um, it could happen to have another, another one, call it P prime, that they're related in the way that there, it, there could be some function, call it F, such that the um, um, probability assigned to any, a, a, any set by P prime is the integral of that function F with respect to um, that, for that, for that first one. Um, in fact, um, as long as um, this one assigns probability zero to everything that this one does, there will always be such a function. That's called the radon Nicodem theorem. And that function is a dense, Density function for this, prob for, for this probability, pr probability distribution with respect to this one. And actually, this one doesn't even have to be a probability distribution. It, it, it could be a unbounded measure. So it doesn't have to, you know, it could be, positive. what's that? Positive. Yeah, unbounded positive measure. Yeah, so yeah, this could be a, you know, a function that assigns an additive set function that assigns um, non-negative numbers to things or else infinity. So. You think if you've got an infinite plane, um, any sufficiently nice set, you can talk about the area of the plane, and some of those areas will be infinite. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, because, um, and the reason I say that is that um, physicists sometimes interchange the terminology and, ca and call the density function a, di a distribution. And, uh, oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Is that what you're going to tell me? Well, any, any, any set. So, yeah, to every, to, every, to every one of my measurable sets, so they're defined on the same set of sets, for, for every A in this set of measurable sets, this is, this is, this is true. Okay. Right. okay. All right. Okay. So, um, all right. So, classical mechanics now. So, that, oh, actually, um, let me guess. So, evolutions um, on in general of probability distributions, if I take some set A and apply my dynamics to everything in A, there'll be some other, uh, other set which I'll call TT of A, which is just the result of applying the dynamics to everything in A. And I think it should be pretty obvious that I give you this kind of dynamical flow in the state space that gives you an evolution of probability distributions. Because if I say, I've got a probability distribution over the state of the system at, at time zero, and I know the dynamics. Well, that gives me a probability distribution about where they're going to be later. So, um, 
yeah, so if um, um, Shelley is in, the, in this room at time zero, but in, in, um, in the next hour, he's going to be walking steadily in a, um, uh, uh, or actually, if, if, we, if you know that in the next, room, next hour, Shelley's going to be walking steadily in a western direction and, and, and while probability distribution over where he's going to be an hour, tell me the probabilities over where he's going to be now and um, the probability of him being in a, in a certain place an hour from now is the same as the probability that, he's, that he is now in a place that's going to get him there. I guess saying that is that, um, so if I want to, you know, this probability for time t assigned to any set A, I guess look at say, well, so now I'll call this, now, now I'm going to call this A. I guess say, well, if I have a probability distribution at time zero, I guess ask, well, what's the probability the probability at time t that's in A is the same as the probability at time zero that it was in a set that, that goes into A. Right, so, and the way, the way we write that is this, this is the inverse image of A. That's just the set of all things that um, evolve into A under that map. It might look like I'm presuming that the map is invertible, that it never uh, um, um, assigns, um, uh, um, it never maps two points into the same point. And actually for the sorts of evolutions we're gonna be considering, they are invertible. But this makes perfect sense, even if the map isn't invertible. And in fact, in, in dynamical systems theory, people study um, non-invertible maps. Because, you know, just everything that gets mapped into A is in, is, is in this thing. All right. Okay, everyone got that? Familiar to m most of you? Um, I guess I want to have it fresh in your mind. So now, um, classical probability evolution of probability distributions on classical state space. Um, the um, useful, the um, Formulation of classical mechanics, which is most useful for talking about such things, is the Hamiltonian formulation, which has been implicitly invoked. Um, if I say Hamilton's equations of motion, can everyone just write them down? Yes? Anyone want me to write them down? Okay. I'm going to anyways. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, um, Ham Hamiltonian dynamics, you've got a set of coordinates um, and their conjugate momenta. You've got a Hamiltonian function that represents the um, total energy and the equations of motion are yeah, same for Q's and P's with up, you know, up, up, up to a, a minus sign. Um, if you have that kind of um, uh, um, um, so suppose we've got a system with that kind of Hamiltonian uh, um, dyna dynamics. Um, a useful measure to, for talking about these things is what's called the um, Liouville measure, which is basically just the um, measure that's uniform in um, these phase space coordinates. So a rectangle with size, size delta Q, delta P time to however many coordinates and things are is just has has measured just just the product of the length of all their of the sides in those coordinates it won't be the product of the length of all its sides in arbitrary co 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 coordinates because i can always do a change of variable and, cha and change it so it, it no, makes no sense to talk about a uniform measure on a uh, on a space until i've told you what variables are supposed to be uniform on but the cool thing, the nice thing about this is that it doesn't matter, if there's a theorem, it doesn't matter which set of coor canonical coordinates I use. Um, so I can do a canonical transformation to other canonical coordinates and a, uh, the measure that's uniform in those coordinates were the same measure as, as, as one. So that makes it a useful um, background measure to use if I'm defining um, density functions. So assume I've got some probability function that has um, some density rho with respect to this Liouville measure. 
Um, and I'm just now going to use x for a variable that ranges over all the phase space points. And that um, 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 uh, um, I'm sorry. Um, that um, evolution of that, me that measure will satisfy what's known as Liouville's theorem. And as a consequence of that, or um, that um, um, that um, the flow um, is is um, um, cons conserves um, Liouville measure. So if I, I take any any um, state, um, you know, so, sorry, take any set that has a certain kind of a certain Liouville measure, and just transport it. Um, the 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 uh, the um, the measure of the transported state is is the same, and that and, and that's important. It also means that if I have any probability distribution, yeah. You want to set that something to zero, right? Yeah, I do. Oh, yep. It means it also means that. If I have any probability distribution whatsoever that's represented by, that can be represented by a density with respect to this measure, then the expectation value over all of my phase space of any um, function on phase space that's just a function of this density. So it has the same value on points that have the same, same um, value for this density is conserved. So I mean, the way you think about it is, you know, if I've got a little set here on which you know treat the density, you know, as 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 constant, and I've got some function of 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 of, of that that um, goes to a set of the same of the of the same measure somewhere else, um, and that's equal to that. So that's equal to that. And if I Integrate over all of those, the expect, you know, the average value of this f is going to be unchanged. Everyone got that? Familiar to some people, hopefully not. Um, given some of the questions, yeah, um, yeah. and that is true for any Hamiltonian flow whatsoever. I'm not assuming that this Hamiltonian is um, is um, constant in time. So you can imagine a situation in which I've got some kind of external field that I'm varying. And so the Hamiltonian itself is changing with time. What I just said still holds true because the, um, this, this equation still holds for that. Energy won't be conserved, but um, it will still be true that um, phase space volume will be conserved and it will still be true that any um, average, uh, for any, um, Probability distribution that can be represented by a density with respect to that measure, the um, expectation value of any function of, 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 of rho is going, is going to be unchanged. So that's important. Any questions so far? Why do we care? Yeah. So do you know where the sum that the rho comes from? What do you mean where does it come from? Yeah? Yeah. How, 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 how? You just wrote it, but do you know where it comes from? Yeah, so how do you derive Liouville's equation? Where, where did it come from? Is that, are you asking how to derive the equation? No. What, what are you asking? What's that? Do you just write this? Or do you, is there, is there a secret from, from which you derive this? Do you want to, um, yeah, okay, where, yeah, where does this, where does it derive? Yeah, so, um, good question. Um, imagine, um, a, pro a flow of a probability distribution, 
Well, um, you know what? When you ask a question and the um, speaker is about to answer it, don't under interrupt the speaker while, 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 while they're answering it. Okay, what I was about to say was, was exactly what you, you just said. Um, if that was too quick to follow, if anyone wants to know, you know about the derivation of the Liouville equation, you know, talk to me, talk, if that's too quick, talk, talk, um, talk, talk to me afterwards. Anyways, um, all right, so um, why did I write it in this form? Because this is something, this is the form that will be found in all, all the statistical mechanics textbooks and I wanted to write an equation that people will recognize when they go now and, and, and um, uh, um, um, open up a statistical mechanics textbook. Yes, I do. I, I, I do. And if I, um, when I, when I do this sort of thing as a more le um, leisurely pace, that's how I do it. Okay. Time constraints. I, I chose not to talk about the derivation of the Liouville equation. Um, we want to talk about the um, consequences. Okay. So, um, what do I want to say next? All right. So, um, what has this got to do with how we're now going to make a connection with thermodynamics? Um, I always said that we, we want to talk, we're going to want to talk about probability functions and evolution of probability functions under various kinds of processes. But what sorts of things am I going to think of as change, you know, adding it to, uh, um, uh, um, adding energy to a system via heat, by, by work and adding by, by heat. And this was already said um, by my friend the other day is, once I figure out what work is, then heat exchange is all, every change is, is all, is, is all the, the rest, right? Um, and that's going to be important because um, um, if I'm looking for a statistical mechanical analog of, of, of that, if I go backwards a bit. Uh, no, I don't want to do that. I want to, yeah, if I want to, if I'm looking for a, a statistical analog, a mechanical analog of this, what I want to do is figure out what I'm going to mean um, in this, uh, for, 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 about heat exchange in the statistical mechanical um, context. And in order to do that, I'm going to figure out, have to figure out what I'm going to mean by work. Because you know, if I know what energy, uh, energy is, if I know what work is, then heat's everything left over. Okay, so here's the idea. Um, and the basic argument that, I, I, that I'm going to give is, or actually, um, comes in, a, in, a, in um, logically, uh, um, the, the logical order of the steps is going to be a little different um, than the order I'm going to give it in. Um, so first, say what you're, what, what you're going to, how are you going to represent, represent in this context um, doing work on the system. Two, say how you're going to represent in this context um, a heat bath, the, 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 the sort of thing the, the, that gets mentioned in, in this and um, derive um, relations between work and heat that, 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 um, the, 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 yeah, yeah, um, yeah, once I know how to compute this, then I'll, I'll, I'll know what goes on the, on, on the left side. Um, so what I'm going to do is, um, for, for the second question, what's going to, how am I going to represent a heat bath? I'm going to simply just tell you the answer. Um, there is an argument for, 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 for this which stems from Sillard and I, and I will give it at the end if there's time. And the reason I, I'm not going to do it right now where it belongs <coughs> is I'm worried that maybe I'm going to run out of time. Um, what time am I supposed to stop? One. <laughs> Seriously, what time do we start? Okay. Yeah.
Okay, all right, yeah, so, okay, yeah, so, yeah. Um, then, yeah, I, I definitely do have to left, leave out that, so that step. So, um, um, so um, here's what can be argued for, and if anyone wants me to, to actually give the argument, a, you know, p parallel section or something like that, I can do it, but um, uh, um, um, I'm going to um, run out of time now. The idea of a heat bath is, is, is um, like, this right. I go back, go back a bit. Okay, how am I, how am I going to um, distinguish between heat and work? Well, think about the um, paradigm case of a gas in a box and a piston that can be pushed in, in, in and out. And maybe it's in contact with a heat bath. The position of that piston is something that's not subject to the same kind of probabilistic uncertainty that the positions of all the molecules are. I can treat that as not probabilistic, but having a definite value that I'm not going to assign any you know, probabilities to, as something that I'm going to manipulate. And in general, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the Hamiltonian of the whole system, which might be a system interacting with the environment. It doesn't need to be an isolated system. And um, I'm going to write it in terms of some variables, which I'm going to regard as these you know, special manipulatable um, um, parameters. Um, so that for, for this, um, for a, for a gas, maybe the only one would probably be the volume of the box that it's in. Um, and if you think about it, that is a term in the Hamiltonian, because really what the walls of the box are is a potential that um, is effectively zero as long as you're um, far from it, but strongly repels when, you, when you're close to it. And then all the others. And it, it, um, um, it, it can be a time, it, it, it can be um, a, a time varying Hamiltonian if I'm varying these. And also, if the um, system is interacting with something outside of the heat bath, well, if there's interaction potentials for those, then that the um, Hamiltonian of the, of, of the system as a function of the coordinates and of the phase space variables of the system could be fluctuating rapid, you know, um, 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 ra rapidly, but I'm going to I'm going to treat those probabilistically. So the difference between um, the controllable parameters and the other parameters is I'm going to just put a probability distribution over the you know, other par other parameters the Hamiltonian depends on, and treat these as you know, having definite values. And the, so the um, the um, What's going to count as work is going to be energy changes of the system due to changes in those um, manipulable parameters, and everything else is um, is heat. Everyone got the idea? Okay. Um, might not be the only way to try and construe this distinction of between work and heat in statistical terms, but it's one of the standard ways in the literature. Um, so, um, heat baths. The idea of a heat bath is it's something that you don't get work out of and, you, and it's something that you can't do work on. Um, Zillard has an argument in that um, paper I, 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 um, I, I, I discussed that though, um, the, 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 that property plus the condition that if I have a whole whole bunch of independent, probabilistically independent heat baths, it still has that property. Um, that, um, by an argument that I can give later, if, if, but I won't give right now, says appropriate um, um, and. Uh, um, an, an, appro an, an appropriate um, probability distribution for representing a heat, a heat bath is the canonical distribution, what um, Shelley called a nice equation. I think that was a, that was a, 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 a blue equation. Um, um, 
And um, it gives, gives a kind of hand-waving arg you know, ar 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 argument for that being appro appropriate to, um, to um, heat baths and things in thermal equilibrium with, with heat baths. I actually do think that um, Sillard's argument is better. There's a really, really, really bad argument, which is that God came to me in a dream and said, there's a principle of rationality called the principle of maximum entropy that says if all you know about a system is um, the expectation value of energy, you, rationality constrains this to be your degree of belief about this. That is as bad as every appeal to some kind of principle of insufficient reason or something like that. It's, yeah, so, um, uh, so um, Kevin mentioned this principle of maximum en 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 entropy. If I had to appeal to that, I, I, you know, I, I would just leave. You know? um, yeah, okay, so. Does, don't need it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Don't, doesn't come out. Doesn't come up in the, in this in this in this context. Um, w well, except in, in 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 the way I've already invoked it. Um, yeah. And okay. So what was I going to say? All right. So here's um, here's the thing. Um, this in this this is this is in in, in Gibbs. Um, suppose I have a system that's Oh, and this, this beta is, inver is, is inverse temperature, 1 over kT, where, where k is Boltzmann-Tassa. So suppose I have two of these systems that, for, that you know, it, a system that starts out in equilibrium with a heat bath, and you can argue that this, a, a system in equilibrium with a system that's canonically distributed go, goes to a canonical distribution to, at the same temperature. So I've got a system that at time zero, I've got um, a conical, canonical distribution. And I'm going to write, you know, there's maybe a, a, a um, controllable pr uh, um, parameter there. And then, I do make very small changes because I want this to mimic a reversible process. I, I maybe change the values of these parameters just a little bit um, and um, maybe, and then put it in contact with another heat bath that's not, a temperature not too di different. So the final distribution is Where these these two parameters differ by a, by a small amount, and these parameters differ by a small amount, and in principle there can be lots of these the, the, these these parameters, and I look at the expectation that so I've got two probability distributions, and I can look at the expectation value of energy in this one, and the expectation value of of energy in in this one, and I will get expected change in energy, right? And it turns out, and it's really, um, really, it, it, it's I guess a few, a few, a few, a few lines, is that um, what you get is um, Um, this just by a little bit, just by a, um, a, a little, little bit of um, arithmetic. This is the expectation value of the of, of the work you did on the system by, by by tweaking these parameters just a little bit. Everything else is the expectation value of, of heat exchange, just by call it Francio's principle. If you decide what work is, um, change in energy is. Um, is work plus everything else in the effort, everything else is, 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 is heat. And here's what Gibbs says about this, and I think it's really Im important. Wait, sorry. Yeah. Can you, can you just, what is that term? I can't read the second term. Is that log? Yeah, log, log of rho, yeah. 
expectation value of log rho, which you've heard of before. Right? Um, but you know, I didn't pull it out of my butt. You know, um, you know I, I didn't pull it out of a, a maximum entropy principle. I, I pulled this quantity because in this very special situation, and it is a special situation where your initial and final distributions are canonical distributions and you, and you have little changes in the parameters, it turns out that if you identify this as expected value of work done, and the reason we're thinking about expected value of work done is, you know, if you're thinking about cases where fluctuations are important and I'm pushing that, hit, that, that piston, I might get lucky and I don't actually have to do much in order to move the piston, or I, I, I might not. So um, the amount of work done is going to be itself a, a random variable. So everything else is ex expected, expected value of heat, ex ex heat exchange. Um, but that's, um, 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 so, you know, this is expected value of heat, of, 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 of heat, heat exchange with this. And here's what Gibbs says, and, and um, I want to give his exact um, um, words. So, it might not look like it, but this is actually exactly the, the equation that I just wrote in Gibbs notation. Um, the AIs are the negative of these things here, and, or AI bar, it, because he's taking an average, and eta for him is the log of rho. He calls it the index of probability. So that first term is, um, um, actually I think I, I, I do, yeah, I, I neglect, I, um, I missed a minus sign. So that, 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 that's, that's wrong. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, you're right. It's expected value of the change of log rho. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so that's what this bar d eta is. So eta is log rho, expected value of log rho. So yeah, thank you. I need it. This equation, if we neglect the sign of averages, is identical in form with the thermodynamic equation 482 on the previous page. The modulus theta co corresponding to temperature, the index of probability of phase with its sine reverse corresponding to entropy. So, since there's expectation values here, it actually sounds like he's saying, well, the, the, in the analog of, of, entro of, 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 of um, entropy is actually eta itself and not the expectation value. So, if that's right, then given a probability distribution, eta of x or log rho of x could vary from place, place to place. Um, so that sentence suggests the thermodynamic analog of, of entropy in this particular case is log rho itself, not its expectation value. But Gibbs in this context is pretty blasé about that. And the reason he's blasé about that is he only expects to get thermodynamic-like behavior um, and hence only, is only looking for analogs of thermodynamic quantities in cases where you've got a large number of degrees of freedom. And he's already, you know, he's already argued, he's already investigated the variance in, uh, um, in um, energy, what he calls the anomalies of, of, of the ener uh, uh, energy in a canonical distribution for large numbers of degrees of freedom and come to, well, yeah, what the, Boltzmann already you know, point, pointed this out. So he's getting this from Boltzmann. So here, the average square of the anomalies of, of the energy, that of the deviations of individual values from the average, is in the general of the same order of magnitude as the reciprocal of the number of degrees of freedom. And therefore, to human observation, the individual va values are indistinguishable from the average values when the number of degrees of freedom is very great. In this case, also, the anomalies of log rho are uh, practically insensible same as the anomalies of the external forces so far as these are the result of the anomalies of energy. So when these forces are sensibly determined by the energy of the external coordinates, the number of degrees of freedom is great, the anomalies of these forces are insensible. So what he's saying is, in a situation like that, it doesn't really matter too much whether you're considering the actual quantities or the expectation values, or they're with high probability going to be very close. And, um, Gibbs, for, Gibbs for, for, for one, 
never ever um, says anything like, well, the, the, the quantity you're going to get is the expectation value, except in cases where he's argued that the, that the, the, um, the variance in the probability distribution is so small that it, that, that it, it, it doesn't matter. Okay, um, running out of time, there's another theorem I want to talk about, but let me for now talk about, um, okay. This was a very special case. Um, I can identify log rho or maybe the expectation or, or my, you know, um, minus k times log rho or maybe minus k times the expectation value of log rho in this, this context, they're going to be more or less the same. I could treat that as an analog of um, ch change of that as an analog of change of entropy. For this special case where I've got the canonical distribution um, before, before and after. Very special case. What about other cases? Good question. Um, Gibbs never makes this Id identification with, with or uh, to treat this as an analog of the entropy except in, for canonical distributions. He, he, what he goes on and says, for microcanonical distributions, micro um, there's going to be something else that's going to be the analog of entropy and he actually gives you two candidates. So for Gibbs, the Application of this to, um, um, you know, as a thermodynamic analog of entropy is restricted to equilibrium distributions for which, the situations for which a canonical distribution is appropriate. Um, what about relaxation to equilibrium? He asked that question in our, our earlier chapter. He, um, he points out that, um, both the canonical distribution, having argued the canonical and microcanonical distributions are appropriate for um, equilibrium in, in, in cases where you've got something in contact with heat bath or isolated at definite energy respectively. Um, he points out that those distributions are the ones that ma maximize the um, expectation value of log rho um, relative to those, subject to those, those constraints. Um, the constraint of having, in the canonical case, the right expectation value of, of energy and um, the um, microcanonical being confined to the energy surface. And he asked the question, can this be used as a, as a measure of this, so that can this expectation value of log rho be used as a measure of distance from equilibrium? And he says, well, gee, no, that, it totally sucks as a, um, a um, measure of distance for equilibrium if you're considering an isolated system equilibrating for exactly the same reason that, um, that um, Shelley said. It's constant for an isolated system. And, it's, and, um, and he says, well, how should we think about relaxation to equilibrium in this sort of thing? And um, I'm just going to, I didn't get, everything done that I wanted to do. I just want to talk about um, um, that. Let me just say that um, there, um, yeah, let me just talk about, talk about this. So, um, yeah, so, so I mean, suppose I've got a system that's, you know, gas is initially confined to a small region of, 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 of phase space. You know, if it's a gas is initially in half a box, that's a very t small region of the phase space because it's one over two to the n, um, you know, has a fraction of the, vol of the total volume where n is the number of molecules. And so on the phase space diagram, that would be an, for a macroscopic gra gra graph, a undrawably small region. And as, um, if it's isolated, as Shelley pointed out, the phase space volume of that region is going to be, um, conserved under evolution, but it's going to get really fibrillated. It's going to get spread out so that, you know, if I squint a bit and um, look at any um, a re region on that, for any big, big enough region, um, then the amount, the, you know, the, prob the probability given to that region is just going to be the, the probability given to it by the, by the, um, by the microcanonical distribution. 
Here's a question. Does that count of equilibration or not? Is there an increase of entropy there? How many people say there's an increase of entropy? Why? Energy has not been lost. What has been lost? This is not hard. No, I want to say ser serious question. What did what did what what, what did we lose? What did we lose if energy is conserved? You do that work. Yeah, yeah. I, you know. If I know the dynamical map, then I actually know an awful lot about where, 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 where that phase point is, because I know there's, there is a very, very small set that I know that it's in, and that is completely bloody useless to me if, I, if, if um, that set is spread out over the over macro regions, and all I can do is, is, um, is manipulate the macro regions. So if we're considering um, equilibration as loss of ability to do work or something like that, Gibbs says, the natural thing to do is to consider not the fine-grained en en entropy, but some kind of coarse graining of it over, uh, over, um, uh, um, over macro states or something like that. And so, you know, with the, um, and so, um, and that, that does increase. So if you're actually interested, you know, if you're looking at something that's tracking what you're interested in, the Gibbs fine grained entropy, Gibbs says, is completely inappropriate for tracking um, uh, um, convergence to equilibrium, but the coarse grained entropy um, um, is, is, is not. So it's not an ad hoc move, um, and it's not a case where he was initially identifying fine grained entropy, what's called fine grained entropy, you know, you know, expectation value of, of, of law grow. He was, it's not that he was initially. Um, 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 uh, um, identifying this with entropy and then realizing it had this flaw. It's just that he never argued that it was an appropriate um, analog of, of thermodynamic ent entropy outside of equilibrium and in fact outside of um, situations of something in compact. Okay, maybe we just say this more general argument which um, is sort of implicit in, um, in um, Gibbs and made more explicit by, um, by Owen Maroney. Um, suppose I've got a bunch of heat, you know, oh, this will be the last thing to say. Suppose I've got a, a bunch of heat baths at temperatures T1, T2, et cetera, and I'm representing all of those by canonical distribution. But suppose at time T0, I've got some system with some probability distribution that's actually completely arbitrary, except it's not yet correlated with these guys, is, is uncorrelated with these guys. And I let the thing, and so I start out with some probability based distribution at um, time, time zero, and I let the thing interact successively with each one of these heat baths, you know, temporarily interacting term and stuff like that. And then at, you know, at some time T1, I've got some other probability distribution as the result of all those interactions. And you can also do work on, on the thing by changing those, those parameters. Um, it's a theorem that um, um, the, um, um, the, ex the, the um, change in um, Yeah, you know, that, that actually now I'm just going to write Gibbs entropy you know, for for you know, for for um, um, so the you know the the um, Gibbs entropy change in Gibbs entropy from T one to T from T zero to T one. is actually equal to the um, expectation value of heat exchange with, the, with, the, with the, um, each of those um, heat baths. It's actually a fairly trivial um, 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 theorem. And notice, um, you're right, I don't. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, it, so um, 
is actually a fairly um, 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 tri trivial theorem. And there, I did assume I'm associating canonical distributions um, with um, each of these. But the distribution of the initial distribution of this is uh, completely arbitrary, except it's at t time t0, it's uncorrelated with the, with the heat baths. And if you, if you, can, if you can now, walk, if you're also in a situation where there's a reverse process that will take you from this state to this state with the, um, not, not necessarily the same heat baths, but, 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 but one that makes the sum total over the, over, over the cycle, that, that, you know, this equal to zero, then there the, is a real sense in which, for those kind of situations, this is playing the role of um, a thermodynamic entropy in the sense is, is that it's telling you something about expected, it, it's tell, telling you something about expected efficiency of a heat engine interacting with these, um, the, the, these heat, heat baths. So, the, the, um, so basically, you know, this all was um, all a footnote to Shelley's last remark that there are connections between these, the, the, uh, the Gibbsian um, fr framework and certain kind of uh, and, and, and th um, th thermodynamic relations. And so thinking of this as in the sorts of limited situations which I'm talking about, um, as playing a role that play, plays a role analogous to thermodynamic entropy, it's not an arbitrary assumption. It's basically, you're forced to it by just saying, I'm, here's how I'm going to construe work, here's expected value of, of, of energy change, and everything else is expected value of, of heat. Okay, so I'm done, I'm running out of time. Do we go straight to the break? I kind of went over time or anyone, any questions?